So now in this final video on prokaryotes, we're going to be looking at the last major component of what it means to live. Remember how we introduced this idea of prokaryotes being the next logical living component in terms of our study of biology too. We started with viruses, which were non-living. We proved that. Now we're on the living, most basic form of life, let's say, and that would be prokaryotes. We've talked about how prokaryotes are structured. We've talked a bit about their function and their replication, the ways that they're genetically diverse from one another. Final thing to talk about in terms of survival of prokaryotes is nutrition and metabolism. And that's what we'll entitle our final flowchart. The nutrition, what it eats, and how it deals with what it eats, nutrition plus metabolism uh, of prokaryotes. Now, in terms of prokaryotes and what they do, what they eat, what they metabolize, it is incredibly variable because there is so much genetic diversity amongst prokaryotes, thus the way that they get energy also varies greatly. So we're going to write this as they vary in energy sources. Some prokaryotes, let's say, are phototrophs. Some of them are able to utilize light energy in order to have an energetic source for them. This would be light. Photo meaning light, troph meaning, let's say, eating uh, process. And then finally, there's also a chemotroph. These are individuals, prokaryotes, that use chemical energy. And these use light energy both of which are seen in great, great uh, complexities and great, great quantities all throughout the prokaryotic world. These are two general ways of stating that the energy sources of prokaryotes definitely vary. There are other actual tropes, but we don't need to get into those details. In addition, in terms of nutrition and metabolism in prokaryotes, we also have to understand that prokaryotes not only vary in energy sources, but they actually also vary in their carbon sources. Carbon, key component of life. It's an organic compound. It's an organic molecule that really, really drives a lot of life as we've seen in our cell respiration lectures, as we've seen in our photosynthesis lectures. In terms of our carbon sources, autotrophs, those that utilize light energy to break down or build sugars, let's say, in their photosynthetic processes, they like to use carbon dioxide. They like to take carbon dioxide and fix it into sugars, things that we've seen before. But this is on the prokaryotic level, not the plant cell level, but the prokaryotic level. This is talking about prokaryotic nutrition and metabolism. Don't forget that. There are also heterotrophs. Things that cannot make stuff on their own, that cannot just randomly take in carbon dioxide and fix it into a sugar. These heterotrophs actually have to do something else. They have to go out and get organic nutrients. That's how they get their carbon. That's how they fix their carbon, let's say. Usually this organic nutrient is that super molecule, that super important glucose molecule that we've studied in great detail in Bio 115. A good way to understand this variation in carbon sources is to look at table 27.1. Great table to show us the great amount of variation in the carbon sources. Again, I said look at table 27.1. Do not put it to memory. Do not um, look at it and be overwhelmed by all the information there. It's just a tool for you to really see the variability in the carbon sources and also um, intuitively the variability in the energy sources that prokaryotes have. Now, we cannot talk about metabolism and nutrition without talking about the most important compound to almost all life on Earth, and that is oxygen. Oxygen plays a critical role in the origin of life and in the continuation of life today. Oxygen can be utilized or is utilized by obligate anaerobes. And who are the obligate anaerobes? Those are individuals that absolutely, um, oh, I did this wrong. Not obligate anaerobes, but actually obligate aerobes. These are individuals, excuse me, that absolutely need oxygen. They are obligated to have oxygen and need oxygen in order for them to do their metabolism, in order for them to do, let's say, something like cell respiration. So these are individuals that need it, absolutely need it, thus the name, obligate aerobes, and those are those prokaryotes that need oxygen. We would call them obligate aerobes. Now, 
Another obligate is not aerobes, but obligate anaerobes. These guys do not like oxygen. They are not fond of oxygen. They would actually rather use things like nitrate ions, possibly. Totally different molecule, nitrate ions, or maybe even something like sulfate ions, both of which can be utilized for these obligate anaerobes as replacements. Now, what is the role of oxygen for any aerobic respiration? Think back to the ETC. Think back to cell respiration. The point of oxygen for both you and I, for anything that's an aerobically respiring individual, it is the terminal electron acceptor. For obligate anaerobes, the nitrate ions, the sulfate ions, these are what are going to act or acts as electron acceptors because they don't like oxygen. So they use something else instead of that super duper O2 molecule, instead of O2. Okay? So to each their own, right, in this situation. And finally, we also have something a little bit fancier called facultative facultative anaerobes. These prokaryotes are uh, able to adapt. They can adapt to conditions. They may go anaerobic, they may go aerobic, it all depends on the conditions presented. So that's a, a very cool fact about these prokaryotes. Okay, They all have an intimate relationship to oxygen, whether it's not having a relationship at all and utilizing something else as an electron acceptor or absolutely needing oxygen or being a little bit of a mix in between. Finally, last point of this lecture is the following. There's also a big, big idea of nitrogen metabolism that we actually covered in a couple of our ecology lectures uh, in terms of prokaryotes, what role they have. And that role is exemplified by the ever-famous nitrogen cycle that we all know and love from Bio 1. Just as a reminder, look at figure 55 14 to jog your memory of this beautiful cycle that we mentioned before. The nitrogen cycle will involve steps like nitrogen fixation. Remember how we kept on saying that at certain, almost all the steps, bacteria are involved. What are bacteria? Bacteria are prokaryotes, and thus prokaryote nutrition and metabolism plays a big role in the nitrogen cycle that we see on Earth, specifically nitrogen fixation, let's say. Nitrogen fixation hopefully we didn't forget, is when we turn N2, nitrogen gas, into NH3 ammonia. How do we do this? On top of this arrow, you can write down bacteria. Bacteria do this. Nitrogen fixating bacteria are the uh, big components that allow for this to happen. And the other type of step that utilizes bacteria would be nitrification as well. Nitrification, hopefully we all remember, is when we go from NH3 all the way to a nitrate ion, NO3 minus, and this would be done through bacteria, thus done through prokaryotes. So that's it. That covers all of the prokaryotic knowledge that we need. Hopefully, through this, you understand that prokaryotes, though simple, have these complex mechanisms within them, specifically in regards to something like their cell surface structure. Very complex, very diverse. It's, it's not good to think of these prokaryotes as just free-living, you know, things, single-cell, unicellular, oh, who cares, you know, bacteria everywhere, whatever. That's not the way to think about it. It's important to understand that bacteria are everywhere, are pervasive and dominant because of these characteristics that we've talked about today. Hopefully, of course, you've gained a greater appreciation for these prokaryotes, both the archaea and the bacteria. We didn't really get into the archaea, but the bacteria especially have a big, big role in everything that we're going to be looking at from this point forward, especially in terms of the evolution from a prokaryote to a eukaryote, as we'll see in our next lecture.